1 Samuel chapter 17. And instead of entitling the message, David versus Goliath, which you might well expect, I entitled it, David is fit to be king. <laughs> A little surprise there. You recall back in chapter 16, let me put the other lights on, it just seems dark. There we go, it gives me more light to see. You recall back in chapter 16, uh, David was anointed king by Samuel. And, of course, it's made clear in 1 Samuel that Saul is no longer fit to be king. He has disobeyed the Lord too many times. God has uh, been disappointed with Saul. God has found him a man who is after his own heart who will obey God. That man is David. He was anointed in chapter 16. So I believe chapter 17 is a chapter that shows the character of David and that he is fit and suitable to be king. So let's read about this. Let's study this. Uh, we all love a good story where the underdog, the weak person, comes out triumphant. And we know David comes out triumphant not because of his own skill per se, although he was skilled in a, as being a shepherd and fighting off wild animals. He was good with the sling. He had talent. But he came out victorious because it was God's will that he be victorious. It was God's providential will that he defeat uh, Goliath and the Philistines and uh, rout their army. So number one, let's look at the threat. There's a threat. And so often we encounter threats in our lives. We encounter problems. We encounter situations that at first seem insurmountable to us. How am I ever going to get through this? How am I ever going to get over this problem? What's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome of this situation that has developed? And so we have threats that creep into our lives as well. So here's the threat. Letter A. Israel and his war with the Philistines. The Philistines were now encroaching into Israelite-controlled territory. In fact, letter B, uh, they were on one side of the Valley of Elah. I understand the Valley of Elah is only 12 miles from Bethlehem. We all know Bethlehem, right? <laughs> That's where Jesus was born, in Bethlehem. And so uh, if the enemy is, uh, say, about 12 miles away, they're encamped on the one mountain on the one side of the Valley of Elah, the Israelites are camped on another side of the Valley of Elah, that would seem disconcerting. Um, if we had our army, United States forces, 12 miles away from Bedford, waiting for an enemy to attack, would say, well, that's uncomfortably close, isn't it? Too close. So uh, this is a very serious situation. The Philistines want to make inroads into territory that's already been controlled by Israel. And so the uh, Philistines have amassed their army in one mountain on the one side of the Valley of Elah. The Israelites are on another mountain on the other side. And the Philistines have this wonderful proposal. They bring down their champion, their star, their star and prize fighter, Goliath. We'll look at him in a minute. But Goliath comes out and says, look, give, you, give me one man among your army to fight with me. If I win, says Goliath, well, you Israelites are going to serve the Philistines. But if the Israelite warrior wins, then we Philistines will all serve you. Here's the deal. So we don't have to have a big fight among all the, the warriors. Let's just have a match-off between uh, two soldiers, one and one. See how it goes. Well, of course, let's look at Goliath. Let us see Goliath here. He's over nine feet tall. Let's read about this. Verse 4. And the situation just looks worse and more threatening all the time as Goliath keeps coming out day by day, presenting himself with all of his height and all of his uh, military uh, uh, implements, and the Israelites are scared to death. So verse 4, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now I did a little reading and a research on a cubit. A cubit is supposedly the distance between your elbow and the tip of your finger. So that could range about 16, 17, 18 inches, depending on the size of the person. And then a span says, what, six cubits, and then a span. I understand a span could be the, 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 the distance between, if I stretch out my hand really good, the tip of my thumb to the, my, the, my little finger. That could be a span. <laughs> Not real precise measurements per se, but if you do the math, that could easily put Goliath up to nine feet, nine and a half feet. That's pretty big, pretty tall. Now notice what is said here. Verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, so his head's well protected. And he was armed with a, a coat of mail 
The weight of the coat was uh, 5,000 shekels of bronze. I understand that that coat of mail goes from the neck to the waist. It's meant to cover the upper body. And other translations say that weighed about 125 pounds. So you'd have to be a big, strong person to support that uh, covering to protect your uh, main body. And then we go on to verse 6, and he had bronze greaves on his legs. That would be like uh, leggings, if you will, that are made out of little bronze or metal plates. So in verse 6, he had uh, metal leggings and a bronze javelin. That would be like a short spear that he had slung on his back. And then verse 7, now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his uh, iron spearhead weighed uh, 600 shekels, I think that would be about 15 pounds, and a shield bearer went before him. So here he is, he's got his helmet on, he's well covered from neck to waist, he's got metal leggings on, he's got a, a short javelin on his back that was meant to be thrown, he has the big larger spear, and someone goes before him with a shield. So that's pretty intimidating, isn't it? Who wants to go up against this guy? <laughs> so there's the situation. So he comes out day by day, the text says, for 40 days he presents himself and makes this, uh, you might say, offer uh, that a man of Israel would come and fight with him. So that's where the situation stands. And there's sort of a standoff. No one knows what to do. So here comes the resolution. Let me just show you all the sub points. So there's a resolution. Now, don't you love a story where there's a real big, huge problem and then God works to resolve it. And God works in marvelous ways. So here's the resolution. David to the rescue. And again, the chapter is showing that David is fit to be king because it's going to emphasize his character. So letter A, David just goes about his business. He's just doing what his father told him to do. Good son, he obeys his father. So if you will, notice again verse uh, 15. That says, David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David has previously made trips down to the battle lines, to the front lines, to see his brothers. This is nothing new. He's done it before. In verse 17, uh, the father said to David, take some of these provisions. Take some dry, dry grain, these ten loaves, uh, run to your brother, see how they're doing at the camp. Carry the ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand." and come back and bring me word. And so we read on that Saul was there in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So in verse 20, what does David do? He rises early in the morning and sets out in this trek 12 miles down to the valley of Elah, maybe a little shorter to where the Israelites were actually camped, and he certainly brings the provision. Now in verse 22, we're told that he leaves the supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. Hmm. He didn't bring the ten loaves to his brothers, and he didn't give his ch the cheeses to the captain of the thousand. He just left everything with the supply keeper. Maybe that's what David did in the past. So that's what David is doing. He's just going about his business. Perhaps for David, he thought it was another ordinary day, another ordinary trip down to the Valley of Elah to see how his brothers were doing as they were with Saul. And someone has pointed out that so often, as we go about our ordinary lives, as we go about doing the ordinary things that we normally do, God can use us in extraordinary ways. Sometimes things happen. And we're right where God wants us to be at his time and at his place, all appointed by God to carry out what God wants us to do. And it might be just something simple, just helping another person, just giving them a word of encouragement, uh, just uh, getting some information so you can go home and pray about someone or some situation. So there we are. David's going down to the camp. Oh, I already have it moved down. Letter B. Let's go to letter B. So David asks about a reward. I never noticed this before. But again, as I was doing some reading this week, someone pointed out that, boy, David keeps asking about the reward. We all thought David went down there and just sort of got mad. Who is this Philistine? Think he's coming out to defy the living God. But David keeps asking about the rewards. What's, what's going to be done? Hmm, what's going to be done? What's the reward going to be? So it sounds like David has a human side here. He is interested in the reward. If you will, notice verse 22. Verse 22. So David left uh, his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. He ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. And then as he talked with them, there was this champion, the champion of the Philistine, uh, this Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. And what were those words? Well, the proposal is, give me a man from the army of the Israelites, and we'll fight. Whoever wins serves each other. 
You know, that's how it was. If the Philistines win, then the Israelites have to serve the Philistines. The Israelites win, then the Philistines serve the Israelites. So verse uh, 24, and all the men of Israel, uh, they were, saw the man, they saw Goliath, and they fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. That's the second time we read in this passage that the Israelite army was terribly afraid. So verse 25, so the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Question. Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be, here's the reward, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption in Israel. Three great things. Lots of money. Uh, Saul will give his daughter in marriage to the man who defeats Goliath. And his father's household will have tax exemption. Well, wouldn't that be great? Tax exemption. No more taxes to pay. But notice verse 26, the very next verse, this reward is repeated again. So David spoke and said to the men who stood by him. See, David's thinking about, what's the reward going to be? If I go out and kill Goliath, what am I going to get out of this? Verse 26. So David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me just mention something here at this point. For David, it's not that Goliath has defied the armies of Israel, although that's true. But for David, Goliath has defied and belittled and made fun of the armies of the God of Israel. Goliath is poking fun at God. That's what bothers David so much. So we have a little uh, side uh, where, where David has a little discussion with his older brother, Eliab. We'll get to that in a minute. But notice verse 20, um, tw uh, 30. Let's go to verse 30. Verse 30 again. Then he, uh, David, turned from him, that is from Eliab, his brother, toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So we're not quite sure what's being asked, but some think that in this verse, David turned to other people and asked, well, what's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath? And everybody answered the same thing. They'll have great riches. They'll receive the king's daughter as wife, and uh, they will have uh, tax exemption in Israel. So it seems like David is quite interested in this reward. Let's go to letter C. Well, David's older brother, Eliab, has some words for David. Sometimes in families, there's friction. <laughs> we all know about that. <laughs> That's nothing new. So notice verse 28. Now, Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. So Eliab's overhearing David ask, well, what's going to be done? What's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath? And maybe David asked that a couple of times. And maybe Eliab's thinking, well, does David honestly think he's going to go out and fight, fight this, this Goliath? Now, keep in mind, Eliab hasn't gone out to fight Goliath. <laughs> he, like all the others, are scared. And he's got his younger, little brother, the little brother who keeps his father's sheep. Just a youth. And he's asking, what's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath? And people are kind of getting the impression that, well, maybe David's ready to go out and fight Goliath. Go well, back to verse 28. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? So Eliab is kind of speaking down. He's speaking in a condescending manner to David. Why did you come here? And you just, you just, you just keep a few sheep. I doubt his father had a few sheep. His father probably had lots of sheep. And then Eliab goes on to say, I know the pride and the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. In other words, you've come down to put your nose where it doesn't belong. You're meddling. You shouldn't be here, David. Now, maybe the brothers don't know that David left the provisions with the supply keeper. And maybe David, uh, maybe the, Eliab doesn't know that his uh, father sent him there. And he's just doing what his father asked him to do. Because his father, Jesse, wants to know how the three older sons are doing. So it's kind of like Eliab might be a little jealous here. After all, remember back in chapter 16, Samuel came down and all of Jesse's sons had to parade before Samuel one by one. And, and Samuel thought, oh, surely it's Eliab. He's so tall and he's so handsome. And so, God said, no, <laughs> don't look on the outward appearance. 
and so finally it was the youngest. So maybe there's a little resentment on the part of the older brothers that it was the youngest brother of all people in the family that was anointed to be Israel's next king. So there's a little friction there. Uh, and of course, uh, Eliab professes or thinks he knows David's heart. He really doesn't. David came down, I believe, with the best intentions. All right, letter D. Let's look at David's great faith. So after all, David keeps asking, what's going to be done for the man who kills Goliath? He keeps interested and in keeps talking about this reward. So people finally get the idea that David's actually interested in fighting Goliath. So they bring David to Saul. So let's go to verse 31 now. Verse 31. This is letter D. We want to look at David's great faith. And when the words which David spoke, that is, he kept inquiring about the reward, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. So Saul sends for David. Then David said to Saul, verse 32, let no man's heart fail because of him, that is, because of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Wow! Think of the courage of David. No one else wants to dare step forward, but here's David, just a, a keeper of sheep, if you will. Uh, good at hand-to-hand -hand combat with wild animals, good with a sling, good at protecting the sheep. And he says, I'm going to go fight with this Philistine. Don't worry about a thing, Saul. I'll take care of this. And Saul must have felt on the one hand relieved, but he's looking at David, probably a fairly small person compared to Goliath, having no military training, no expertise in an army at all. And, and Saul's getting a little nervous. Notice uh, verse 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are but a youth. And he, Goliath, a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and, and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose uh, against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. And your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Wow, David has a lot of courage. It doesn't seem like he's scared at all. He has all this confidence. But I believe David is trusting in the Lord. He's trusting in God. Notice verse 37. Moreover, David said, the Lord, notice this now, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he, the Lord, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So David is not trusting per se in his ability with a sling or his ability to go hand in hand with wild animals and defeat them. He says, the Lord, the Lord has delivered me from lion and bear and the Lord God will protect me. He will deliver me from Goliath. So David's trust is firmly in the Lord God. And we know how uh, the story goes. David tried on Saul's armor. Saul said, son, you better take all this armor, put it on. I'm not having you go out there like, like you are. So David tries on Saul's armor and he walks in and it doesn't feel comfortable. It feels awkward. He can't maneuver. And he probably feels like he can't, he can't have good agility. Uh, he can't move quickly. Uh, when he uh, ha has all this armor on. So he says to Saul, I, I just can't use this. I haven't tested it. I'm not going to use it. So then we get down to verse 40. What does uh, David do? Verse 40. He took a staff in hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch, which he had in his, uh, in his sling and his, it was in his hand. And then he drew near to the Philistine. I understand in ancient uh, warfare, there often were archers and slingers. I didn't realize this. They actually had people who were, who were archers, good with the bow and arrow, but they had people who were good with the sling. And uh, oftentimes, these uh, rocks that they would sling, well, they were a little bigger than a golf ball, but maybe a little smaller than a baseball. So you can imagine, if you get hit in the forehead with something like that, you'd be out. <laughs> you'd be out cold. You'd be gone. So it wasn't like a tiny little pebble that, that David's picking up out of the brook. It's probably a fairly sizable stone, maybe bigger than a golf ball, smaller than a baseball. And so this is what he does. He goes out there with, without any armor. He's got a staff, his sling, and these stones. Maybe he only picked up five because maybe that's all he could carry. Maybe that's all that would fit in his uh, a little pouch that he had. So in verse 41, so he came near to the Philistine. Verse 41, so the Philistine came and began to draw near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. Verse 42, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. In other words, he mocked David. He made fun of David. For he was but a youth, 
ruddy, and good-looking. Wow, <laughs> he made fun of David because he was young, ruddy, youthful, and good-looking. Now remember back in chapter 16, when Samuel anointed David, what did it say about David? He was young, he was ruddy, and he was good-looking. <laughs> and we would surmise by the way the story's told. I could be wrong, but I would surmise that Goliath was not young, he was not ruddy, and he was not good-looking. <laughs> so, uh, Goliath isn't too happy. And so, verse 43. So the Philistines said to David, Goliath says to David, Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. So, Goliath felt, you might say, embarrassed. Uh, that they're sending out this, this champion, supposedly, from the Israelite army to fight with him. He thought it was a joke. You know, he, Goliath probably couldn't see any way that David was going to win. You know, he, he just felt it was just no threat at all. He was probably feeling pretty easy and pretty comfortable. But he had a big surprise in for him. So verse 44, And the Philistines said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, and notice what David says, because this really speaks of David's great faith and his great confidence in God. In David's words, there's no might be, or I hope so, or, man, I'm sweating this out. No, notice what he says, verse uh, 45. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, and you come with a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You have made fun of my God, says David. You've made fun of my God. You don't know who God is. I worship and serve the Lord God of hosts. I worship and serve the Lord God of the armies of the angels of heaven. You come to me with your spear and your sword and your shield and all these other military equipment and, and pieces and things and so on. But I come to you in the name and in the power and the authority of God Almighty. Boy, that makes all the difference in the world. We're in God's side. God will help us. God will defend us. God will protect us. God will sustain us. So we see David's faith, we see his confidence. And then verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you. It's not might be, could be, should be. This day the Lord will. He will in fact deliver you into my hand, into my power. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth. And all the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David has great Everyone's cowering in fear, but David steps up with faith and courage and confidence in God. Boy, isn't that the kind of person they want to have king in Israel? The kind of person that has faith in God in the midst of a terrible national crisis? David's the hero to the rescue, and he's certainly fit to be king. Let's go to letter E. David cares about God's honor. So yes, I've emphasized that David really was interested in that reward. Who wouldn't be interested in the reward? But the overriding concern of David, he cares about God's honor. God's honor. He cares about the name and the reputation of God. He cares about how other people think of God. Now imagine if Goliath won, and all the Israelites have to serve the Philistines. What would it say about the God of Israel? Oh, he couldn't defend his people. He couldn't give his people victory over the Philistines. The gods of the Philistines are stronger than the God of Israel. So David's not too happy with the threats and the taunts and the scoffing that Goliath is doing and is making against the God of Israel. So if you will, let's just backtrack a little bit. Look at verse 26 again. Verse 26. Verse 26. Uh, then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What should be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of who? The armies of the living God. He doesn't say the armies of Israel. It's the armies of the living God. We belong to God. God is the true and the living God. All the other gods worshipped among the nations are just idols. They're nothing. We worship and serve the true God who has real power. Notice again verse 36, if you will. Verse 36. So here David says to Saul, Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied what? The armies of the living God. It's not just that he defied the armies of Israel. He's defied the armies of the living God, the powerful God, the God who really is. And then in verses 46 and 47, we just looked at those a minute ago. Uh, notice at the end of verse 46, the end of verse 46, David says he's going to defeat Goliath and he's going to give him to the, you know, the birds of the air and his carcass and so on and so forth. 
and uh, he's doing all of this, that uh, God is going to give David victory over Goliath so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's why David wants to beat up Goliath and win. Because David wants everybody to know that his God is the true and the living God. And David wants everybody else to serve his God, to love his God, and to worship his God, because his God is the only true God. That's why David is going to go out and defeat Goliath. That's why he wants to go out and win over Goliath. God uh, is loved by David. David loves God's name. David cares about God's reputation. And that's the kind of person God wants to make king in Israel. Then, of course, in verse 47, uh, then all the assembly will know, this is part of David's concern, then all of the assembly shall know, that's probably all the assembly of the Israelites, maybe even the Philistines too, they shall all know that God does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So God is the one who's going to give victory. David wants God to be honored and glorified and praised and loved and worshipped and served. So David is not here to make a name for himself, although as we follow the story in 1 Samuel, uh, David does have a good reputation among the people. So the next time we're facing obstacles, trials, difficulties, the next time we feel like the underdog in the face of something that's really bothering us, remember David and remember Goliath. My father used to say, son, just remember, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> So don't worry. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. So uh, David won a great victory. But it was all part of God's plan. It was God's will. And just keep in mind now, David was just doing what his father told him to do. Take these loaves, take these cheeses, get down to the, you know, Saul's camp. You know, give the, give the loaves to your brothers, give the cheeses to the captain of a thousand, check in your brothers, see how they're doing, and just come back and bring me a report. I want to know that my oldest sons are okay. And wow, David was just going about an ordinary day. And think about what happened. One final point, just to look at the, the, the broad picture here. So what is God up to? What is God doing? Well, because of this, uh, David is going to endear himself to the people. Overnight, David becomes a national hero and a national sensation. Not that David ever planned it that way, but that's, that's what God is doing. Let it be. God is propelling David forward on a path to make him king. God has... You might say David's life planned out. God is going to cause certain things to happen to David to make him the kind of man that would be a good king. And also, as letter, I said in letter A, to endear him to the people. And then, of course, let us see what's going to happen in the broad, broad picture here. Uh, David is going to become king. And from David comes Jesus the Messiah. And we know the promise that God made to David that will never cease to sit upon your throne, a man who will rule over Israel forever and ever. We know that person is Jesus the Messiah. So God has a big plan. Sometimes we might feel like we're just a small little uh, spoke or a small little cog in the wheel of God's plan. and we, That's how we feel, but God has things planned out. We don't know the future, but God has things planned out. And God used David in a marvelous way uh, to be, you might say, the father or forefather of Jesus the Messiah. And through David came the Messiah, and God's great plan of salvation was fulfilled. So anyway, let's be encouraged by this great story from the Old Testament. Uh, problems are no problem to God. God can solve our worst problems. God can take care of all of our fears. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. And Lord, we thank you for its outcome. We thank you that you are with David. Lord, we thank you that you gave David victory. So Lord, help us to have the kind of faith in you that David had. Help us to be strong in our faith. Help us to see you, not the problem. Lord, help us to see the size of you and your power and your majesty rather than the size of our problems, Lord. So, Lord, just build us up in our faith. May we go forth energized to serve you all the more, Lord, because we worship us the great God, the Lord God of hosts. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll close with a song.